Over to you, Mathieu. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, and welcome. Welcome to this Knowledge Cafe. My name is Matthew Koniak. I'm with the International Labor Organization at the New York office. Back in May, we already uh, had met for the launch of the uh, UNSDG Acceleration Toolkit. Some of you will remember that event, which really made available over 100 tools uh, to support the accelerated progress towards the 27, the 2030 agenda. Then uh, after that, we met again on the 17th of November, not, not too long ago, um, to launch the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, IPPN, which is uh, the place from where we meet today. So the question is, uh, what is really the IPPN? It's a platform that was built on the recognition that the UN system needs to work in a more integrated manner at the country level. And uh, it was enabled by the um, uh, UN reform of the Secretary General. It's really an extension of the former UN SDG task team on integrated uh, policy support, which was originally co-chaired by UNDP, UNICEF, and the ILO. And today, with IPPN, I'm really happy to, uh, to report that more agencies are joining. Uh, and actually today we warmly welcome the FAO, IOM, UNAIDS, UNFPA, UN Women, WFP. I'm sure many more are coming. In addition, of course, to the private sector, to civil society, to academia, and, and really to the public at large. So the IPPN is, is hosted on an open and accessible platform for online engagements that was built by UNDP to really enable development practitioners to connect, to collaborate, and to co-create. Uh, it was designed to enhance in very concrete, very practical terms, policy integration and coherence in the joint support that the UN development system provides to member states for achieving the 2030 agenda. Now, we know that building forward better, especially now from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, is going to require integrated approaches and policy coherence, while at the same time, really taking into account the specific situations and the needs in the countries and in the regions. Now, with today's first official event of the IPPN, we will be looking at the theme of policy coherence between the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda. Uh, I let you guess it's a very important theme and uh, because first the coherence between the Paris Agreement on the one hand, which as we know is a legally binding international treaty on climate change, and we also know it was adopted by 196 parties at COP21 in Paris in December 2015. And on the other hand, with of course coherence with the 2030 agenda and the 17 goals that were launched at the same time, and which of course also address climate action through goal 13. Could almost add another reference uh, closer to us in time, which is the Secretary General Common Agenda, which calls on countries to adopt the, the ILO guidelines for a just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies and societies for all. A call that we have also heard again at the COP26 in Glasgow recently with a declaration on just transition from a number of member states. Now, for this important discussion, we're really lucky, we're really fortunate to kick off the IPPN uh, activity uh, and, and being joined by Ms. Zoha Shawu. She's an associate scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute, SEI in short, SEI US, working in the Equitable Transitions Program. Her research focuses on policy coherence between Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement, exploring synergies and conflicts between climate goals and SDGs with a particular focus on inequality repercussions. She also works on climate finance, including loss and damage finance and climate finance coordination in developing countries. So we'll be hearing from you in just a minute, uh, Zoa. Uh, we can't wait, but just before that, very quick housekeeping rules. Number one, this meeting is being recorded. Number two, we do have a full agenda. And number three, we have limited time we have exactly one hour. So I will encourage all participants to please use the chat function that you have available to you in Zoom to introduce yourselves and to post any questions and comments. And we will come back to you after the presentation of uh, Zoa with, with your questions and I will, I will identify you and I will uh, give you the floor for interventions that will hopefully be succinct so that we can 
leave the space for everybody who, who wants to, to come and participate. So thanks very much. And Zoa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Matthew, and thanks to ILO, UNDP, and the IPPN for having me. Really excited to have a rich discussion with you all today. Um, before kicking off the presentation, um, we wanted to have a quick poll with the audience to get some thoughts and perspectives, um, especially since we have a broad range of people joining from different countries and organizations. Um, and we'd love to have your input on some of these topics that we've raised today on policy coherence um, and some of these trade-offs between climate and development goals. Um, so if we could have the poll on the screen. So we have three quick questions on which we'd really like your input, and I'll just quickly read through them now. Um, the first one is, is coherent implementation and the need to avoid trade-offs central to your work when implementing the SDGs and climate goals? Secondly, uh, can policy coherence ensure successful implementation of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda, in your opinion? Uh, and finally, which factors do you consider most important for increasing policy coherence efforts at the national level? Um, and you can choose up to three here. Interesting to see that a lot of the audience um, is focusing on coherence and policy coherence as part of their work, um, which is good to know. And people generally seem very positive about the role of policy coherence in implementing the two agenda, which is also um, interesting. And we'll kind of touch on the nuances of that a little bit in the presentation as well. Um, and a very mixed response on um, which factors are considered important, um, which again, we'll kind of go through a little bit in the presentation um, on which factors based on our research we see uh, have come across as important. Um, I'll just leave this open for a minute or two just to get some more insights. Um, but what's striking me here is that ensuring political will from the highest levels of government is so high up in, in question three, um, since I think it's not often talked about very much in the context of policy coherence. Um, so that's really interesting perspective. May I okay. display the results? Yes. Oh, sorry. Does, do, can people not see the, the results? Um, yeah, it'd be great to display the results. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I'm most struck by question three and the very diverse range of um, responses as a result of that and people having very different views on which factors actually do influence policy coherence at the national level. So I'd be really keen to touch on that a little bit more um, in the discussion itself and hear more about how these factors are playing out in a different context. So um, thank you very much for responding um, and we'll head into the presentation now. Thanks a lot for your input. So I hope you can see this, but I wanted to kind of start by um, highlighting the highly integrated or intertwined nature of climate and development challenges, as we are increasingly seeing through evidence from um, both research and civil society, um, and I've just highlighted a couple of examples here. So. For example, the IPCC 1.5 report um, highlights how uh, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees rather than 2 degrees would make it much easier to achieve many aspects of sustainable development and the sustainable development goals with greater potential to eradicate poverty and reduce inequalities. 
This was um, kind of a key point made by um, chapter five of the 1.5 report, which very much focused on sustainable development, poverty, and reducing inequalities, which in itself to have in an IPCC report um, is an indication of how these challenges are becoming increasingly intertwined. Um, and the AR6 Breaking Group 2 report, which will come out early next year, also has a chapter focusing on climate resilient development pathways, which again highlights um, these issues of synergies and conflicts between the two agendas. Um, so, uh, secondly, I've also highlighted here the latest Sustainable Development Goals report, um, which again mentions the interdependency and interlinkages among various dimensions of sustainability, including health, well being social and economic prosperity to climate change and ecosystems. Um, so this is the flip side where the sustainable development agenda is also increasingly recognizing the interlinked nature with climate change, um, not only through SDG 13, but going beyond that to recognize um, our temperature targets as well. So just to highlight that. And within this context, the need to address inequality itself has, not, has never been more critical. So these are just some headlines over the past few months that I have pulled out from various news, news articles to just highlight how um, the, the framing and discourse around climate change is very much changing to be very focused on inequality, um, highlighting how climate change would have inequality repercussions and increasing inequality, um, but also how um, climate solutions and climate policies themselves could also have inequality repercussions and increase inequalities in some ways. Um, and uh, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has only further stressed these issues by um, highlighting or very much uh, shedding light on the um, inequalities that are embedded within our governance systems and societies in and of themselves, um, and just highlighting how um, progress by the people at the top have very much been at the benefit of um, those at farm. So um, this kind of highlights how these, basically we have these triple crises in play. We have kind of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change and inequality. And this question arises of how can we really reconcile these challenges um, and make progress on climate change and fighting climate change in a way that does not exacerbate inequality challenges as well. Um, and so I also wanted to highlight some early evidence from some of the research that we're doing at SCI. Um, on one side here in this diagram, you see some uh, findings from this online tool we have called NDC SDG Connections, which essentially assesses and codes um, countries' NDCs from an SDG perspective to basically um, assess how the extent to which different SDGs are reflected in countries' climate policies and NDCs specifically. Um, and here you can see that the three least represented um, SDGs include SDG 5 on gender equality, um, SDG 10 on reduced inequalities, and SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions, all three of which relate to inequality in some way. Um, and this really shows that despite what I've just said about the interlinked nature of climate change and inequality, countries are not actually reflecting on this in their climate plans, right? Um, so their climate plans and policies are not really considering inequality dimensions of sustainable development and how they can tackle these inequality dimensions through climate policies in and of themselves. So this highlights a potential gap here in policy coherence. Um, secondly, um, on the other side here, we have some case study analysis that we did, um, and this is a policy brief that we published um, uh, last year or so, which kind of um, shares preliminary insights from six country case studies that shows that in cases where there is policy incoherence between climate change and sustainable development, inequality is often a trade-off. Um, so, for example, when countries or governments are planning for um, transitions away from fossil fuels, there are challenges with a just energy transition and leaving behind fossil fuel workers, for example. Or when countries are planning to enact fuel taxes um, to reduce emissions, they could potentially open up an urban-rural divide, leaving behind rural populations that uh, would be most impacted by such taxes. Um, another point worth mentioning here is that SDG 10 has received the least policy coverage in countries' voluntary national reviews or VNRs, which report on their progress on the SDGs as well. Um, so all of this highlights that although we're seeing the interlinked nature of climate change and inequality within the global discourse, it's not really being reflected in countries' national plans, and this is a potential gap um, that we need to address. 
And this also raises some difficult questions. So firstly, how can we address the climate crisis in a way that not only enables us to limit temperature increase, but also creates a more equitable world for all? Secondly, how can we move away from unequal power dynamics, vested interests, and profit-driven patterns of capitalist exploitation that created the climate crisis to begin with and left certain populations more vulnerable than others? So how can we really address the root causes and drivers of inequality and climate change simultaneously? Um, and finally, how can we correct historical wrongs and prioritize meeting the needs of marginalized communities to ensure that we are leaving the one behind as we transition to a more climate compatible world? In our project at SEI, we are trying to explore these questions through the lens of policy coherence and looking at policy coherence as a potential way to jointly implement climate goals and SDGs and therefore potentially um, to reduce inequality and repercussions of climate policies themselves. So this, this is just one question that we are exploring in our research. Um, ever since the inception of, or the establishment of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 agenda, the topic of policy coherence has been pretty high on the agenda um, with conversations and research being published on synergies and conflicts between the goals, the internal nature of the goals themselves, um, potential spillovers or externalities or positive benefits of implementing certain SDGs for other SDGs. Um, and this has kind of really cemented the policy coherence agenda or brought it up high on the agenda again, um, particularly through, for example, the OECD's work on policy coherence for sustainable development and these kind of reintroducing um, these concepts of mainstreaming and having a whole of government or joined up government approach. Um, to policy making for climate and development. So in general, there's been a very positive framing overall of policy coherence in the discourse here, but um, we see that it's not always happening in different countries at the national level. And that raises the question of if ensuring policy coherence is so rational and straightforward, why isn't it happening? And what is at stake if it does or does not happen? Um, and one of the ways in which we are exploring this question as well is through taking a very political or politicized approach of assessing policy coherence. And what I mean by this is that conventionally, policy coherence has been assessed in a very institutionalist and technocratic manner, with a very much a focus on intergovernmental processes and fostering synergies and reconciling conflicts. So for example, a lot of the, the framing around policy coherence has been, well, we need different government ministries to talk to one another, and then we'd have greater policy coherence. Or for example, we need to mainstream climate change into budgeting processes, and then we'd have coherence. Um, but the realities, as our evidence has indicated, is that there are other factors in, in play that are more political in nature, which inhibit or limit the extent to which policy coherence can take place, and if it does take place, the extent to which it is actually successful in achieving goals. And uh, we characterize these political factors in our research around the three I's, which emerge from the comparative politics literature. So ideas, institutions, and interests. Ideas refer to, for example, underlying values, norms, and assumptions about the world. Um, so societal norms and discourses and framings, for example. Institutions are more the conventional understanding of coherence, which relate to procedures, rules, routines, like conventions, and then again, different organizational structures. But institutions themselves can also be political, of course. Um, and then interests um, refer to material considerations and preferences and power embedded um, within actors. So for example, the interests of large corporations or fossil fuel corporations in different countries might be playing a role in inhibiting policy coherence. Um, and we'll touch on that further later on as well. So taking this kind of these political dimensions in mind, we've tried to um, develop an analytical framework for studying policy coherence between these two agendas at the national level. Um, and this kind of just lays out that framework. Um, I'm sorry if it's a bit overwhelming at, um, at first glance, but I'll just unpack it quickly to say that there are three main research questions that we're trying to address as part of this framework. So the first is on what causes policy incoherence, and this is where the three eyes come in, ideas, institutions, and interests, and we kind of understand them as underlying factors which would influence policy coherence in different policy stages in the process, including in policy formulation, in policy content, and in policy implementation. 
And then the second half of the diagram um, focuses on the relationship between coherence and policy outcomes. So um, the two questions here are, is coherence necessary or sufficient for goal achievement? And uh, secondly, do coherent policy processes have more equitable outcomes? So addressing the inequality dimension. And going into this a little bit more in detail, um, the second part of the diagram we've developed further into this outcomes framework, um, which basically assesses these, these two relationships, the relationship to incoherence and goal achievement, and then the repercussions for inequality or the distribution of progress on goals. Um, and the way that we're planning to kind of assess this in our future research at the national level is um, through looking at local perceptions. So we know that the SDGs and climate goals and NDCs would not be achieved until 2030 in theory is the target, right? So that makes it very hard to say, well, policy coherence has taken place and goals have been achieved since their progress is still underway. And it's hard to kind of measure empirically. So we will mainly be relying on local perceptions of progress. Um, so conducting interviews with policymakers and decision makers and civil society and local communities to get their perception on whether progress on goals has been made. And if so, how equitably that has been distributed, have some groups or communities been left out, for example, in progress on specific goals. Um, but we, we be keen to get feedback on, on whether this local perceptions approach makes sense as well. And of course, we will also be drawing on data that is available on progress on goals, such as through countries' voluntary national reviews as well. Um, and now I just wanted to share some preliminary examples of how we've already had gathered some data from preliminary case studies um, that corresponds to our framework and addresses some of these questions. Um, so just to flag that we have kind of nine country case studies as part of this research project on policy coherence, which includes Sweden, Germany, South Africa, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Fiji, Australia, and Colombia. And these were selected to represent a spread in different income levels, um, different levels of fossil fuel dependence, as, uh, as shown here, and um, different levels of inequality as demonstrated through the Gini coefficient. And the way that we'll be studying policy coherence in these different countries is through having a different kind of issue area in each country or um, a set of goals and policies that we'd want to um, explore in more detail. So for example, just energy transition, looking at the relationship between goals related to climate, employment, um, energy inequality, and so on. Um, so just to share some preliminary examples here. So in Australia, for example, we found that um, post coherence challenges mainly relate to the high levels of political polarization and partisan disagreement between different um, government uh, parties, and as well as the high level of influence from the fossil fuel industry, which leads to conflicts relating to the phase out of fossil fuels. Um, we've also seen challenges around the exclusion of indigenous communities from decision making, um, leading to inequality trade offs there. In Fiji, uh, we've seen that they've actually had a very um, climate-centric approach uh, to implementing its policies with, for example, its voluntary national review, emphasizing the importance of achieving SDG 13 as a precursor to achieving all other SDGs. Um, but there have been a lot of conflicts recently with, for example, their high dependence on the tourism industry for economic development and job creation which is leading to conflicts with climate goals due to the high emissions associated with the tourism industry. Um, in the Philippines, we've seen kind of uh, challenges related to green growth. And, oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Is somebody changing the slides? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so in the Philippines, we've seen kind of challenges related to um, green growth and ensuring kind of economic development goals are achieved in, in a way that do not kind of have um, resulting rise in emissions and also kind of some adaptation challenges that have been in play in the country due to its high levels of uh, extreme weather events risk as well. Um, in Sweden, uh, the climate law actually requires the government to present a climate report every year in its budget bill. So you have this kind of mainstreaming approach of 
incorporating climate change into budgeting and so on, but you still see a lot of conflicts with, for example, inequalities with rural communities. So there's been this issue of um, the expansion of airports and municipalities to increase access for rural communities conflicting with climate goals, and then fuel taxes, as I mentioned before, negatively impacting those in rural areas. Um, in Colombia, we've seen challenges around the insufficient involvement of multiple stakeholder groups in planning, monitoring, and implementation of SDGs, which are potentially leading to trade-offs for different actors, particularly women, again, in rural communities in this case. And we've seen a lot of challenges around deforestation due to agricultural and land use expansion and, and extractive industries for, again, job creation and economic development. Um, in Sri Lanka, uh, we've seen kind of a high level of fragmentation with lots of different ministries and agencies making policy components difficult, but at the same time, they do have a, a sustainable development council, which functions as a central coordinating as, uh, agency for the SDGs and liaises with other sectoral agencies. Um, but at the same time, the, the ideas factor plays into, it comes into play because um, highlight government officials have this very economic growth framing of achieving different goals, seeing economic growth as a way to make progress on all other goals, um, but this has also created inequalities for different vulnerable populations. Um, in South Africa, we kind of have a high level of economic reliance on coal, um, with a lot of the marginalized population employed in the coal industry and kind of different interests playing a role from fossil fuel and coal companies, but also from labor unions um, versus other groups that are supporting the low carbon transition. So these different interests also make um, policy compliance more difficult. Uh, in Germany, you've kind of also had this challenge of just energy transitions, although there is a coal commission in place to facilitate that transition. Um, and we've also seen other kind of factors related to a recent increase in popularism and a decrease in multilateralism, which could further delay the effective implementation of the two agendas. Um, and then finally, in Kenya, we've seen challenges around, again, balancing socioeconomic development with addressing climate change, um, particularly since the exploitation of fossil fuels is still on the rise to um, ensure the country's economic growth as well. So those are just some initial examples. And as I said, we're planning to take these case studies further in the next year, particularly to address the second part of our framework around the relationship between coherence and whole achievement um, and inequality. So we'd be very keen to, to hear your thoughts um, on that as well. And yeah, I believe I will stop there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Hope you found it interesting. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Joa. Uh... I find it very interesting and, and very complex. And, and really the last slide showed that there are almost, it seems that there are almost as many uh, countries as there are stories in terms of the policy coherence between the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement. So how do we take all this forward? Uh, what can we retain as the, the, the big steps, the next steps? We'll invite uh, all of you to submit your questions, please. Uh, Raise your hand uh, in the form of a question in the in the chat box, and we will come to you and uh, ask you for your for your views. Uh, and maybe to to help you with a little bit of of guidance at first, I understand Zoa that you have some uh, preset you know questions for for everyone for for the audience. So I'll uh, I'll let you raise those, and and hopefully we will uh, be able to to come back to uh, our audience right after and. Uh, and, and have a participative discussion, really. Thanks a lot, um, Matthew. So I will just pull up the three questions that, that we have for discussion that we, and that we'd love your input on for further research um, as we go ahead. So firstly, uh, can you share examples of the role of policy coherence in implementing climate goals and SDGs in your own countries or as part of your own work? We'd love to hear about that. Um, secondly, um, do you have any suggestions for how barriers related to ideas or vested interests could be tackled or overcome or navigated to, to either ensure policy coherence or make progress on goals and SDGs? So moving away from this idea of, um, you know, greater institution coordination and thinking about how these other challenges could also be tackled as part of policy coherence. Um, and thirdly, um, how do you think our future research could potentially assess um, the relationship between policy coherence and goal achievement, including inequality? 
does our proposed approach of looking at local perceptions make sense? Or do you have any other kind of ideas or anything there? Thanks a lot and looking forward to your questions as well. Thanks again, Zoa. So let me see here. Do we have any questions from our audience? I don't I don't see any hands raised so far, do we? Not yet. Yeah. Well, maybe we can pose those questions uh, again on the screen to let everyone a little bit of give everyone a little bit of time to, to reflect on those. And uh, as we wait for your hands to be raised or for your questions to be posed in the in the chat box, Zoa, maybe uh, the logical thing is to start with you, <laughs> and and maybe to ask you your own questions, uh, starting maybe from from the last one you raised because you're a researcher uh, at SEI. Um, what can you tell us about future research and uh, and what maybe you have in the pipeline in terms of, you know, the further analysis of this policy coherence and the goal achievement for uh, uh, including inequality, really. Do you have any, any future upcoming research that you want to share with us or any, any ideas for really what needs to be done to, to have a, a better grasp of the situation? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just say quickly, I mean, I see hands are going up, so I'll just say quickly that um, our, our research, future idea is just to take these nine case studies further, right? So now we've just done some clear preliminary assessment of kind of what are the key synergies and trade-offs in the different countries, um, but we really want to kind of go further through doing more in-depth interviews, a combination of focus groups, and potentially surveys as well in the different countries. Um, to really particularly address the, the second half of that relationship um, on the relationship between policy and goal achievement, including inequality, and part of that might involve, for example, talking more to, to local communities to get their perception of whether, um, you know, according to them, there has been progress on these different goals and whether coherence has played a role there. Um, but yeah, I'm keen to take more questions from the audience. All right. Okay, well, thanks very much. So we, we are beginning to have uh, questions coming in. I would like to invite Gonzalo Pizarro maybe to, to take the floor. If you want to uh, open your camera and uh, your mic and tell us where you're from, what you do, and please raise your question, Gonzalo. Hello? Yes, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, excellent. Right. So uh, thank you, Zoha, for a very, very interesting presentation. I was just, I mean, in, 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 in your question about policy coherence, um, I immediately came to mind in that, I mean, first, Gonzalo Pizarro, I'm the regional advisor on SDG integration for the Arab states in uh, UNDP's regional hub uh, in, in Amman. Um, so when, when you started mentioning it, immediately came to mind the, the, the instrument where most countries, uh, that most countries use to mainstream SDGs and, and sort of like guide uh, their, their, their implementation in a more coherent way is through their national development plans that uh, if, if in, in theory should inform also the budgeting process uh, of, of the country, right? So that's kind of where, where the structure is. Um, and the instrument for, for the Paris Agreement are the NDCs, uh, sort of like kind of the equivalent. So in, in my mind, to, if we want to have policy coherence, the NDCs should be part and parcel of their national development planning and budgeting. Uh, so how would you come about to, to actually doing that? Because in, in, at least in my view, in my experience here in the region, they still remain quite parallel processes. Over. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I, I agree with you that I think that they both remain quite parallel processes. And I think that very much comes from, from the top with how you know the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement agenda is negotiated very separately from um, the sustainable development agenda and the BHFDFs, for example, took place in an entirely separate setting. So um, that further creates this divide between the two agendas at the national level as well. And I think our evidence also indicates that um, Oftentimes, NDCs are not reflected in climate, uh, sorry, in sustainable or national development plans, but at the same time, national development plans are not reflected in NDCs themselves, as, as our evidence from the tool kind of showed. Um, and I think it's also because of the kind of the loose nature of the Paris Agreement itself and how, you know, NDCs are kind of voluntary commitments, but um, don't have as much weight at the national level in terms of policy making or policies compared to the national development agenda, for example. So um, I definitely agree that that's, that is a challenge and we've seen that in a lot of different countries as well. So um, I would agree that the link between the two would need to be stronger. Um, and I think the way to do that is, um, you know, to demonstrate how the national development plans are in and of themselves a benefit for strengthening NDCs because um, they already lay out a lot of the activities that countries already have in the pipeline or are planning to implement um, and framing those as, as climate goals or as climate policies themselves would kind of be a very straightforward way of strengthening NDCs, for example, you know, by saying that, you know, progress on health or progress on different SDG goals could themselves also be climate compatible or be part of climate targets for adaptation, for example. So, I think it is very much about changing those narratives um, and not seeing the two as separate and not seeing climate change as a separate challenge, but very much as part of the development challenge overall. Um, so I hope that, that answers part of your question. But I'm yeah, again, keen to hear from others on the floor who have experience of doing that already and share those examples. Thanks, Zoa. And, and I see we we'll just jump to the next uh, question here. I think we have a hand that is raised by Henry McGee. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, I'm, I, I'm a museum consultant based in the UK, uh, working on how um, to support museums and similar, similar institutions to ba basically to contribute more effectively to sustainable development. Um, and I, I think I can give you an example of the role of, of policy coherence, um, like from, um, so say when the framework convention was for climate change was on from 1992, it's nearly near 30 years old. It has a an aspect in it about the importance of public education, training, public awareness, and so on, which are six elements which are, are there because they're related to, to basic rights. Um, and for whatever reason, action for that has, has just not been enough. And so there's a new programme that was adopted at COP26 um, for this thing. It's called Action for Climate Empowerment. And it replaces, the, there was the, this thing called the Doha Work Programme. The Glasgow Work Programme pretty much mirrors what was in the Doha Work Programme, but includes four, I think they're called priority areas, four like uh, essential um, aspects to help this stuff happen. And the first one is policy coherence. And I think the, the way I think about this is like policy coherence uh, in terms of a governance, um, set up really not just about top down or governments which of course the sdgs are, are not supposed to be either but of course it's the countries who who agree them so i think it's just really i think i can see from that glasgow program that we're moving to a different approach really which is much more about implementation and so that, that was my contribution thank you Thank you, that, that was super interesting. And that's kind of exactly the question that we're trying to explore here is kind of the relationship between, between policy coherence and at the content level in terms of actual policies being coherent and then at the implementation level and whether conflicts actually arise when you are implementing policies that look coherent on paper, but are not in practice, for example. So thanks for sharing that. Thanks, uh, thanks, Henry and uh, and Zoa. Now we have another question coming from Fulvia Farinelli. If you'd like to uh, turn your camera on and state where you are, where you come from, and your question. Yes, 
Yes, please. Hello, good morning. Yeah. My name is Fulvio Farinelli. I'm the senior economist in the RCO in Argentina. And my question is related to the COVID crisis. I was asking whether you think that, that the COVID crisis has made policy coherence in implementing climate goals and addressing inequality at the same time more difficult, more challenging? I guess so, uh, um, at least from our perspective. And so if that is the case, what can we do to prove our case, namely to show and persuade that they are not incompatible nor competing with each other? The narrative is nice, but then I, I really feel that, that, that we should do more efforts to prove our case. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really good question. And I think um, I kind of see both sides to, to the debate in some ways. So I think on the one hand, um, in the midst of COVID, there were a few countries that said that, you know, climate or environment related goals would have to go on the back burner because we're in the middle of a different crisis that we need to prioritize now and immediately address um, related to health challenges, right? Um, and so, so I, I, climate was kind of left behind in some countries. But then we also, in other countries, have this kind of uh, green recovery framing emerging as problematic as it is to kind of um, think about the joint nature of, um, of these different you know, health and environmental related crises and think about how we can recover from, from COVID in a way that also is climate compatible, for example. So, but then, you know, at the same time, evidence showed that a lot of countries' recovery plans were not very climate compatible and did not really involve, for example, transitioning away from fossil fuel industries and things like that. So um, I see both sides here. Um, and I do think that overall it has made policy coherence more difficult. But at the same time, one thing it has done is highlight just how integrated these challenges are and how the root causes of a lot of these different problems related to, to inequality and climate change and, um, and health crisis are very similar, right? Um, it might be kind of a, a pandemic, but the impacts of the pandemic themselves are determined and distributed in different ways due to the same factors um, that determine how climate impacts are distributed, right? Um, and so, if the root cause is the same, then the solution would also be the same or very similar, right? In terms of what forces do we need to tackle? What kind of power dynamics are we working with here? Um, and I think that makes a strong case for policy coherence because um, I think in many ways, COVID was a wake up call of um, showing just how much inequalities are embedded within our society and how they would play out when climate, um, impacts are also felt when extreme weather events take place, for example. And so um, I think that that makes a good case for policy coherence as well. Hope that answers the question in some ways. All right. Thank good, you. Good. good. And uh, well, I'd like to now call on Kitty Kun Saksung, who has an interesting question on the science policy interface. If you're, if you're able to show your Open your mic and uh, camera, Kitty Kun. Uh, Are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Kitty Kun. I'm a youth engagement and climate change from UNP in Thailand. And uh, from uh, your present presentation, it's very interesting as I am also working with the youth and uh, connecting like the profession or ex like expertise of the young people into like uh, climate policy and uh, of different sectors. So uh, my question is uh, from, uh, from, from your view right now, um, at, at the moment, I actually, uh, we've heard about like the science policy interface or science policy um, uh, interconnections of how, how important it is to connect both the science uh, side and policy together. And from what you presented um, and also like some of the discussions that colleagues have shared, uh, I'm just uh, wondering whether on this science policy interface, how much has, has it been progressed in terms of the uh, policy uh, coherence that we are talking about and uh, how should we move forward in, uh, really uh, in relation to this topic, uh, are we still like still need to um, emphasize or work more on this SPI, or uh, are we moving on to the next um, issues that might be um, maybe already advanced? Just um, to well, like to like hear your ideas uh, on this. Thank you very much. Thank 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure how to fully address this, but I mean, because, you know, as a researcher, and um, I feel like I'll always be biased in my answer and saying that, well, science and research is always important in, in informing policy. Um, but, you know, I do think that it, it very much plays a role in showing um, basically that that policy coherence is not as straightforward as it looks on paper, you know, uh, as has been kind of um, fleshed out before by different policymakers. Um, and so I think it plays a role in unpacking those, those nuances, for example, and kind of really addressing those hard questions that policy might not be addressing at the moment of um, who is policy coherence efforts? Like who is it serving, right? Um, who is being left behind? Um, and for whom are goals being achieved, for example? If there are synergies, if there are trade-offs taking place between different goals, who is winning at and who is losing out? And kind of really shedding light on those different, um, different aspects and gathering evidence to demonstrate that, right? Um, and for example, um, through research and science, giving a voice to marginalized communities um, and kind of spotlighting the repercussions for them um, for not having policy coherence in different contexts. Um, so, so I do think that, that the research play a role in that context, but if there are other researchers or scientists on the call that have a perspective, I'd be keen to hear that too. Good. Okay, so we, uh, we have another question. Before I come to this other one, there is someone posted uh, Gimba Joshua, but his uh, or her connection is uh, not very good. So just to read out, uh, uh, this person mentioned a good example in the case of Nigeria, which managed to integrate climate change and air pollution mitigation plan to its national development priorities with its budget allocation process being the incentive for action. I don't know if you're uh, aware of this, uh, Zoa, but it's quite an interesting, uh, I would say, case study. Um, in the meantime, I see also that uh, Surya Narayana Saripali had a question, and I'm sorry if I missed you earlier in the flow of the questions coming in, but the floor is yours if you want to take the floor and open your camera and mic. And please state um, who you are, where you are. Good evening, good afternoon. Good morning. I am from India. I am an engineer. Uh, I am in uh, most of the UN uh, discussions since last 10, 12 years. So uh, my, of course, uh, what uh, the countries are discussing is the underdeveloped countries are given a uh, less understanding of their requirements for a fuel to power and productivity. So uh, our main important thing is, of course, I wrote some papers uh, for FAO also on methane emission because of rice paddy cultivation. So, uh, so uh, the growing of animals, the growth of agriculture, also religious methane. Apart from that, the other gases which we would like to count is mostly industrial gases, either because of the productivity of steel, cement, or other uh, items, or because the power requirement for house, uh, food, or whatever it is. So uh, one is, can we count the release of gases by at least a region or by country, first item. Second item, uh, second item is uh, we are also uh, discussing in this uh, about the need for a new, instead of fossil fuel, some other fuel for productivity, for power. So you can explain what you meant. Thank you. Thank you. So um, in relation to your first question, I, I don't think I have the expertise to answer that because I'm not a climate scientist. So um, and I'm not sure how, how to go about answering that question and measuring um, emissions from different gases. On your second question, um, 
So some of our case studies have found, um, such as I think the Columbia one, have found kind of um, potential trade-offs with kind of biofuel production. And I think that's a pretty well-established case of how um, rounding up biofuels for climate reasons often creates trade-offs related to competition with food security um, and then also potential challenges around deforestation and biodiversity loss and things like that. So those are some um, interesting uh, trade-offs we've found between the agricultural sector and biofuels and, um, and climate. That's interesting. Thank you. Okay, I will, we still have a bit of, uh, of time, so uh, feel free to raise your questions or make any comment. I see that uh, some of you are adding comments. I see that Henry who spoke earlier, added in the, in the chat box, uh, the new Glasgow work program on action for climate empowerment adopted at COP26 to run until 2031 with a URL there. And in the meantime, Zoa, you, you've talked to us a little bit about uh, what your research is and where you focus on SEI, the Stockholm Environmental Institute. Can you tell us a little bit about the practical process for applying the tools, the SEI tools at the country level? That could be an interesting uh, question, I think, for, for many uh, who are watching today. Sure. I mean, I. Um, we have kind of some tools such as, um, for example, a tool that we have in place is called S um, SDG uh, interactions. And that basically allows you to visualize the interlinkages between different SDGs and essentially score them um, against one another to basically uh, identify how progress on one specific SDG target would influence progress on another SDG target. So um, we've been thinking about using them in different contexts with um, different stakeholders in different countries, gathering them together in a workshop, for example, um, and asking them to, to score those interactions at the national level, but then also doing some kind of these scorings at the global level to compare the differences between the global and national level, for example. Um, and we can um, share share the tool and kind of the relevant resources as part of that as well. That would be interesting. All right, thanks, thanks, Zoa. I think that we have hands raised from Alexia. Alexia, you want to take the floor? Sure. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Alexia, for yeah, please. Um, so, how do you m measure policy and coherence beyond the tools that you have available to you? So, when we talk to policymakers about their perceptions of where policy and coherence lies, um, how do you sort of measure those perceptions, or how what is the sort of the benchmark that one uses to say this is policy incoherence or this is not. Thank you. So um, I think I didn't hear your full question because we couldn't um, hear you. Fully. Could you repeat that? Too? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Alexia? Can you hear us? Alex, I don't know if you can hear us. We were wondering if you could repeat the first. No, we don't hear you. Can you try again? No? Alexa, you can also type your question in the chat. Thank you. OK, so in the meantime, that you maybe type your question in the chat. We'll go to Shantung, who also was raising uh, her hand there. Shantung. Shantanu. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Shantanu. I'm with uh, the UN uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And I wanted to make one comment and raise one question. So first of all, thanks for this really interesting talk. We work quite a lot with SEI and so, uh, it's great to see this presentation. So my comment really was uh, about the question raised earlier about the science policy interface. Obviously, you know, uh, 
there are many ways to cut slice this pie, but for the colleague from Thailand who was asking this question, I would just like to draw his attention to the Global Sustainable Development Report, which came out in 2019, which I think was really, uh, it was actually, you know, it was, I'm speaking about it partly because it's a plug for our own work at DESA, but it was also written by a panel of scientists. And I think one of the interesting things it did uh, was actually that uh, it tried to prioritize from a scientific perspective, areas where action was most urgently needed. And I think this was interesting because that's really the kind of dialogue you could have with policymakers saying, here is where you need to focus attention if your timeline is 2030. So it identified, identified six areas, it's at a global level, but it may be an interesting way to you know, attack this question of how to get science to influence policy in a way that makes sense to the policymaker. Uh, so that was my comment. And my question uh, to Zoha really, you know, we talk a lot about policy coherence, but you know, we also increasingly understand that many of these actors who are going to be most influential are not necessarily policymakers, right? I mean, there's the private sector, there are young people, there are civic society organizations. So I'm wondering how to bridge from policy coherence through the correct kind of incentives so that you actually have action coherence. Um, and I'm wondering if any of your research is going to look at the kind of bargaining or discussions that go on between different actors as they try to move towards a more uh, consistent and holistic pattern of action. Thank you. Thank you. So just to make sure I understood your question correctly, you're talking about how do we move from kind of policy coherence um, at the kind of objective level to, to actual implementation and kind of managing the interests of different actors. Right. Yeah, I'm, yeah, so I'm actually thinking less about the interministerial coordination and so on, which is of course important, but more about, for example, if you want to set incentives for the private sector to move in a particular way, uh, and the private sector itself is influenced you know, by its own shareholders, uh, civil society movements, and so on, how to harness that? Should we not be talking about something broader than just policy coherence? Yes, so uh, I, I'm not sure I'm going to have a good answer to your question, but I will say that, um, you know, one thing that we've found in our research that plays a key role is the, the interests of different actors, right? Different actors have different interests. Um, and so um, how do you manage that in a way that doesn't really rely on the framing of policy coherence, as you've said, not everybody knows what policy coherence is and not everybody really understands why, why it would be necessary or not in different contexts but um, managing those different interests to make progress on the goals overall. So moving beyond just the idea of policy coherence for the sake of policy coherence, but looking very specifically at goal achievement, right? So how do we actually make progress on the goals themselves in a way that doesn't exacerbate an effort in the specific context? Um, and so one of the things that we've been discussing in, as part of this work as well is that there may be contexts where where incoherence is just the normal state of affairs in different countries, right? Um, and no matter what you do, um, coherence efforts would only go so far when the ways of working are just different and where incoherence is a normal state of play in those different countries. So in places where that is the case, how do you um, then make progress on specific goals without relying on policy coherence specifically? And how do you navigate context of incoherence to still make progress on, on specific goals? So, that's kind of how we have been framing it, but I don't think we're far enough uh, in our research yet for me to provide an answer to that. Um, but I do know that there are others from our research team on this call. So if anybody wants to jump in, um, Katie or Addis or Mariana K or anybody else, feel free to come in. All right, well, th thanks Zoa and, and thanks Shantanu, sorry for misspelling your, your name. Uh, our colleague Shantanu from uh, from UNDESA. So we have one minute left, actually just a little bit less. So we will wrap up. I saw that there was a hand from Cathy. I don't know if Cathy, you can ask your question very quickly. I saw also that Alexia asked a question in the chat because uh, we couldn't, the sound didn't work. I think you have partly responded to that because she's asking about how do we measure policy incoherence at a national level beyond using tools like the NDCs, SDG connections, for example. I don't know if you want to expand a little bit on that and if Cathy would like to come in. Uh, so uh, in order, Cathy, please. And then in your response, you can add uh, the point from Alexia and then we'll wrap up. So Cathy, 
Katia, are you there? Okay. So if Katia is not there, maybe uh, I'll ask you, uh, Zoa, maybe your, your final uh, response based on what Alexia asked, and then we will wrap up. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, my quick response to that is that there isn't really um, an objective way to measure policy coherence in different countries, right? Um, and I think that's um, one of the key takeaways as part of our early research on this work as well, is that there's not really, I mean, we can look at different policies and policy content themselves and kind of assess how coherent policy objectives and goals are with one another um, at the content level. But beyond that, um, we wouldn't be going about actually measuring policy coherence, but really assessing the extent to which coherence is taking place or is there or not. So looking at coherence both as part of the process um, and as part of the outcomes themselves. And our, um, as Alexia knows, we've kind of tried to develop kind of indicators and criteria against, for example, the three eyes to assess how they would play a role in influencing coherence. And we'll be likely doing something similar for the second part of our framework on assessing the relationship between coherence and goals. All right, so thank you very much, Zoa, and thank you, everyone. It's been a really a great discussion. I think a very good, nice kickoff of the IPPN. We are almost running out of time. It's 9.01 here in New York. Before we close, I would like to uh, invite all of you to uh, follow us in the next editions, of course, of the uh, IPPN. We will be talking about food systems in January, about coherence and in February about UN resilience guidance in February, I'm sorry. Um, if you want uh, to make sure that you have access to the IPPN and all the links, and if you have any questions to the team, uh, all of these URLs, all of this is uh, being uh, presented by my colleagues uh, in the chat box. So you can refer to that and be sure that we can you can uh, be in touch and follow IPPN um, in the future for these uh, these events uh, that are that are incoming. Thank you again, Zoa. Before I close, I just want to say also a very big thank you to the group of people that are invisible and yet most important to actually make events like this happen. So thank you so much to Nadine, to Ricard, to Katerina, to Idil. Uh, this type of event takes actually a lot more to organize and the eye can see and you have been very instrumental. And uh, we will see you all next time for uh, a next topic and a next discussion. Thanks again. Thank you, and thanks for having me again. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you.